everyone. It's been or I should say I've had it I've been to another convention, I should say, with Warcon 2023, which means it is time for a convention report. And well, Comorcon this year was the weekend before Thanksgiving. And the attendance I think was down a little bit from last year. Let me double check. I might just realize I should have pulled this information up before I started recording, but that is the fun of doing a live vlog. Um, okay, it's about the same. It's about equal. Um, which kind of makes sense because it's about more, I think it's more or less in the same window. Not quite. It wasn't quite in the same spot of the weekend before Thanksgiving last time. It was the weekend before the weekend before Thanksgiving. So it's not necessarily as much of a scheduling difficulty for people in terms of the issue of getting time off too close to Thanksgiving while also conflicting with, depending on whether you work retail, getting time off for Thanksgiving or for that matter, fight, um, well, that sort of thing. So that worked out pretty well. Um, so I'm kind of pleased that tennis worked out okay. Um, we did encounter right before the convention a whole bunch of cancellations of international guests. Um, Stereo Dive Foundation was going to be the musical guest for the convention this year. I, I considered going into the performance, but ultimately, like, Ended up canceling. There was going. There is. Um, did have Acme present, and they're going to be playing at the after party. But as it was, I was kind of like after after convention, like I need to unwind, and that, I'm not in the sense of like to go to a party and unwind, but like I need to just totally veg out. Um, as more of an autism sensory overload kind of thing over the course of the convention, but that was okay. I uh, so. I didn't do as much music stuff this year as I thought I might do. I, I've been on a kick of going to more concerts this year with going to see a band made earlier, going to see um, Final Thing, Final Fantasy Distant Worlds again when they came to town before that. So like, okay, like I thought, you know, this year I'll go, I'll stay up late. I will go to one of the concerts again. Um, but ultimately decided not so much. Maybe next year. Um, we did, I did go to is we had our first Japanese voice actor guest. We've had Japanese, we've had um, industry guests in the past. We've had uh, from as far as Japanese industry guests, we've had Studio Trigger multiple times. We have had um, Yoshitaka Amano. I've actually on this channel, you can find a video I recorded at one of his um, art sessions where they let us record him. Painting, which is something they normally don't let the, with Japanese guests, they normally don't let you do. So I like took advantage of the opportunity at, at that time and I recorded it then. Uh, no such recordings here, but I did. I have a note, I have note paper, I took notes. Um, so I, I did that for the first of Kana Ueda's two panels. I didn't go to the second one. Um, the events were based like. From the sounds of things, they were both more or less the same format, um, and that they were all strictly Q and A, and Q and A from the audience. Now that said, that is something where, from what I've heard from other panels and that sort of thing, or from other podcasters doing convention reports from back east and so forth, that sounds like the kind of thing that can become a nightmare. Thankfully. This wasn't that. Um, because also the, the questions were walk up to the microphone, ask your question, and the translator translates them and translates the answer. We didn't get that. Um, additionally, we got a fair number of Japanese speakers. Can't speak to their fluency, but Japanese speakers among the ask people who are asking questions. The, 
first off, I'm glad that they were, all of them were considerate, translated their, uh, gave their answer first in Japanese and then in English for the benefit of the audience. Um, I also, like, it's an interesting thing. I don't know how much this happens back east. I don't know how much you have somebody going up, asking a question to uh, Yoshitaka, um, um, to Amano, or Tamino, or any other Japanese industry guest. Hey, I'm asked this question in Japanese or anything like that. So, um, with, so anyway, questions were, like, generally interesting. Some of them were, like, small, like, a lot of them tended to be smaller ones. Um, that sort of stuff. Um, run interesting bits like, I, for example, so the 20th anniversary of the Fate franchise is coming up, and the main, the big five voice cast. Um, it, Wade did say that she she would like with the big five voice cast. It's her uh, voice actor who plays Saber, who play, one who plays Shiro. Um, Archer and Sakura, especially um, actress by Saber, would like to do an appearance that year at a British anime convention or UK anime convention, I should say, because that's where the character Saber is from. It would be appropriate, um, and especially that some of them have just not had the opportunity to go to the UK ever. And it'd be a fun first time to do that. So, UK anime fans, if you're watching this video, talk to your local co uh, convention organizer people, see if you can get this worked out. Um, thing I I had heard, which I or had I learned in this panel that I did not know before, is that Ueda is from the Kansai region of Japan and normally speaks with Kansai with the Kansai Ben accent. She's doesn't do it here, but she's it's the public appearance thing, but she speaks it normally. And that's led to her getting kind of a sine wave pattern, getting cast ultimately in roles that use that the Kansai Ben dialect. Um, like for example, one of the, the other things other than fate that I've taught reviewed a fair time bit here is Hayate the Combat Butler stuff. And she is the Japanese voice actress for Sukuya, um, who is Nagi's cousin from Osaka, and who thus her whole thing is jokes about, you know, um, Japanese stand up comedy and sketch comedy. So that that makes sense. Um, other stuff, I did take a lot of notes. Um, she, also, two gotcha games she's done voice for, um, Grand Blue and also doing stuff for Genshin. Uh, unfortunately, like, she does a really good job for some of these questions of either, either the, they're getting read uh, or translated odd by the translator, or she's just dodging them. and. Some cases, kind of weird, like acting process stuff that I'm going to say is somewhat unnecessary. Um, but in terms of like, one of the questions was about performance style and preferences and that sort of thing. Um, because frequently, as if you've watched um, Shirobako, which we reviewed on the podcast previously. Um, we see some voice acting sessions, and a lot of them are done with the voice actors together in a room. Um, radio play style is, I guess, how I like to refer it, like to describe it. And with um, with voice acting for a gacha game, you don't necessarily have that because you have some dialogue scenes with the characters together. If you played uh, Honkai Star Rail or uh, Genshin, you'll have your story vignettes as part of a quest line. But incidental dialogue for your gotcha characters are in isolation. You don't necessarily have them bantering and playing off of each other. And let's talk. So there were a question about the differences of the approach between the two and um, that sort of thing. And she just kind of, yeah, on it. She tries to play the game before she 
uh, as part of the preparation for performance, but like, well, it wasn't exactly the question. It was more like an acting method kind of thing, and I, um, that sort of was the answer, but not really. Uh, uh, the one of my the, the favorite bit I liked about this, though, just which is gotcha related, was with um the fate uh Babylonia series talking about her playing Ishtar and Arishka Gal because they are both characters are Rin faces and that when she came up with the voices for the characters in the game rather than just using the standard Rin voice um like she she came up with different voices for each one it also gets into the character design is mostly the same so it's not just a case of like making significant voice changes necessarily the way you would for say Saber versus Saber Alter, or um, Saber versus Saber Lily, or that sort of thing. So she had the idea of like um, Ishtar as like a big booming projective speaker, while Ariska Gal is a close talker. And at the time she did that, they're like, "This is a gotcha. I'm not doing a dialogue scenes with these characters talking to each other. They're acting in isolation, that sort of thing." And or even if they're doing like spoken dialogue and vignettes, um, they're not necessarily speaking to each other directly. But when the anime came out, you had Ishtar and Ariska Gal talking to each other, and um, way to having to shift gears like really rapidly um, for these with these projective voice for close talker, it's projective to close talker in these scenes, and that being a lot of work, which is an interesting thing to hear. Uh, she is, um, for casting stuff, she tends to be receiving more offers for roles rather than her having to go out to audition for things in the sense of, um, like, basically getting a script sent to her of, hey, uh, we'd like you to, or, like, hey, we're working on a project, we'd like you to be in this, as opposed to um, getting, in, getting invited to an audition. Um, like, I guess we put it, I don't know what it would be. Casting directors going in saying, "Hey, we want you for this role," as opposed up front, as opposed to having to go through the full audition process and competing with other actors and that sort of thing. So it was all in all interesting. I, for time reasons, I was not able to make it to the second Q and A session. Um, hopefully, the questions for that one were as good as they were in the first. But um, and also, hey, I'm glad. The turnout for the one I went to was really good from terms of an audience standpoint. Hopefully, we get more Japanese voice actors in the past, uh, in the future. I should say, um, I appreciate getting the same level of Japanese guests that we sometimes get for the East Coast conventions. Um, I've been listening to podcasts from East Coast anime fans who do who do. Uh, anime Week in Atlanta and Otakon, um, and and we doing go or and Anime NYC and it's the various anime can, New York anime conventions before that for years. And hearing about the mangaka guests that they get and the voice actor guests that they get and the directors and so forth that they're able to get, and like I've definitely appreciated like once we've gotten to. The Oregon Convention Center as a venue, like we've started to be able to get the Japanese guests, and I hope we're able to keep this up. Um, not to jump ahead too far, but like one of the big announcements for close uh, closing ceremonies, uh, as far as voice actor guests goes, we got we're getting Johnny Young Bosch, who is awesome. We're getting him, particularly since we've also like, like we got Steve Bloom as a virtual panel during lockdown. We never got a chance to have him in person. And so getting Johnny Young Bosch now is like with his long established career is great. Uh only other panels. Um caught a bit of a the studio titmouse panel uh talking about adopting Legend of Vo um the critical role Vox Machina campaign to the animated series. Um, and interesting looking at the uh, that panel. Um, this is all day one, by the way. 
um, with them talking about that they were coming to this from the perspective of having, by the time this came out, they're, they're doing it, there had already been a couple different iterations of published role-playing game materials for the credit uh, for um, Critical Role and um, Exandria before this. So the Green Ronin book and then uh, Tales from Wildemount, I think, had come out at this point as well. So you'd had a couple iterations of Matt Mercer and um, company, particularly Matt Mercer, having wor workshopped this material in terms of like maps and floor plans and that's like, like just like particular maps for in terms of planning animation and that sort of things and getting stuff together for the tabletop game and making things work with the tabletop game that the animation staff were able to work on and build off of for things like for example okay we have the map of Iman from the rule book we can now work with that in terms of this is like what the different parts of the city look like and because of their financial class and that sort of thing. And then also with in terms of the layout of the city or when we need to have at the end of season one and start of season two, the Chroma Conclave come in to blow all this up. And so like that is, like that is an interesting thought there. Having recently, I've heard this past year, podcasted on record of Lotus, done a podcasting record of Lotus War. I don't know how much of the Lotus campaign stuff had been published in Japan, as far as in terms of uh, Lotus source books for either Sword World or the standalone record of Lotus War role playing tabletop role playing game, or that sort of thing. By the time they went to do the animation. So how much work had been there was for the animators to build off of for drawing the Great Gor uh, Dwarven Tunnel, for example, in the first episode of the show, or figuring out layout of things like uh, the various cities that our heroes go through and all that sort of stuff. Um, the what the landscape for different parts of the island of Lotus were supposed to be in terms of terrain, tr tr um, in terms of is it temperate rainforest, is it desert or plains or that sort of thing. Uh, others fun stuff. Um, interesting uh, panel looks on a later day. It was day two. The main panel took notes on was on discussion of the ways in which fandom discourse and fan works can contribute to um, the life cycle of a work. In uh, This is done by us, um, somebody from a site called AnimeView.com. And some of the stuff, stuff I'm familiar with before uh, as being part of Trek fandom growing up. And well, afterwards, in the sense of like during follow periods of Trek between movie, uh, between the original series and the movies, and then one that was just the movies leading into Next Generation, I picked up through cultural osmosis from other fans how much fan fiction and that sort of thing, and tabletop role playing games like the FASA tabletop game helped maintain energy among the fandom group circles for a franchise and for that matter uh if you've been watching my other stuff like legend of the four four series which i will return to uh, i do want to do a bunch some more research on shadows of the empire before i get back to that the ways in which not just fan works and fan fiction during the sort of follow period between the end of the Marvel comics and the publication of uh, *Heir to the Empire*, 
where you also had where you had like fan works and then also the West End games role play game material during that period. Um, while not being their own stories directly in terms of like prose fiction, but there was some there, much of that doom providing building blocks for the rest of the setting to come to build off of. Um, whether planet names, um, vehicle types, vehicle designs, that sort of thing. Need to edit out the uh, nose blows. Uh, and. As far as other stuff goes, day one was like my big central thing for that day was rather than going to the AMV contest, which is normally my day one thing, I do instead was going to um, the autograph signing for Kana Oweda. And this is where I kind of, I'm going to do a bit of a complaint. This is where I'm going to do it. <clears throat> so they implemented a new ish system for signatures they had two different types they had paid signatures from um often from english voice actor guests the ones who were charging for signatures you could just walk up pay and you're good for people who are doing free signings you needed to register and what you do this you text message a phone number with the code for the event that you wanted to register for and then do a, and then put your name and they give you a time. And the time in this case was when the event was scheduled to start in the schedule. And this led to a problem, which was when I showed up, I did not show up a half hour early, which is the usual don't show up to line up for events a half until a half hour before they start. This was like, I showed up when this thing was scheduled to sign up, when you're supposed to be there, which means by the time I got there, the line was already full by people, other people who had pre-registered. And I feel like this was an instant, this was a moment where there was a hiccup in the planning process in the sense of I think and what could have been done better is take the signature period, like the overall chunk of time where the person is signing, doing signatures, break it up into slots, and then just kind of figure out how many people your line holds, even if you're doing serpentine. Maybe this is just doing volunteers and just kind of doing a rough head count by like what you've taped out your area kind of filled up the volunteers and say okay here's how many people it is we can takes to fill this up this is how much we do for each window and then say <clears throat> all right we have half hour blocks in this one hour in this three hour period which is when it was filled up they said hey come back in 20 minutes um or like 20 minute blocks and then once they came back in 20 minutes, they then we re started repopulating the line and saying, okay, this 20 minute block has this many slots. However, once you you you, you dial in, you punch in your number and or you, you text the number with the code and your name, and it goes great. Um this is your time spot time slot. Once that slot is filled up, you move on to the next one that's 20 minutes or 30 minutes later. So now it goes, okay, you've done. All right, so let's say the line holds 30 people. Um, the serpentine line, you apply everything out, you can fit 30 people there, Chris. So 30 people text in with a signature gathering starting at um, 4.30. Once you have 30 people file for reservations, that slot is full. The next batch of 30 get 
starts the slot starting at five o'clock or at 450 or what have you. And I think that would have worked better, relatively speaking, um, in terms of causing of minimizing confusion because ultimately what ended up happening was once the line filled up because I'll come back in 20 minutes what everyone ended up actually doing was who was going to be next in line was they all everyone kind of clumped up around that spot because we all had text messages saying we had reservations but we also knew that okay just getting a reservation doesn't mean we get in for the next batch of time and so we don't want to go off too far and in turn, consequently, because since this block of time was like a couple hours or so, if you like text in and say, oh, uh, you have, you're in for the five o'clock or 530 slot and say, oh, the A and B contest gets out at five. I was like, well, um, in that case, I'm just, like in that case, I'm going to go to the A and B contest because I know that I have my spot safely reserved at five o'clock or five thirty, um, and I will sit through and enjoy the AMB, watch the AMB contest, and do that. Or I will go to a panel that I know I can safely go afford to go to another panel um, during that period and enjoy it and have fun with people, and everything will be fine. And when my time comes for my signature block, I will go and get in line, and my spot will safely be there, and I will go do that. As a person who has paneled, um, I appreciate opportunities for, for situations where I don't have to worry as much that, oh, I'm counter-programmed to this other big thing. Is that going to mean that nobody comes to see my panel because everyone's going to be at this big show? That sort of stuff. Um, day two, my big thing there. Um, a couple of my moderate big things. Um, going and checking out the Gunpla con um, contest. Took some nice pictures of that. And I went to the cosplay contest. Uh, last cosplay contest at Kumo that I went to was, it's been a long time. It was back in Vancouver. So it's been almost a decade. Oh God, I'm old. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to turn into a skeleton and then blow away into dust. Uh, because yeah. And it was really interesting uh, checking out this cosplay contest. Um, there's some really great stuff there. Like one of the competitors, that part of their presentation, part of their sketch was they did a pole dance, and they'd only been pole dancing for a month, and they were amazing at what they did. Before I, they, they mentioned at the end of the bit, oh, by the way, they've only been doing this a month, and you get this basically audience equivalent of of the bit in the uh, in the comedy anime where everyone loudly goes what as like the, the camera cuts to outside the building or to low earth orbit to imply the volume of, of of the shock and surprise from the audience or from the people involved in the conversation and like this is a case like everyone was like really impressed and their minds were blown um we had um some really really great musical numbers some really great dance choreography from the skets and so forth uh, a lot of really excellent work people clearly put a lot of time into getting this choreography right um excellent excellent costumes uh, some of the ones that actually did fairly well I managed to get pictures of them on the hall in the hall cosplay. So I was able to get like a better picture of what these costumes look like rather than trying to zoom in on my cell phone from like uh, eight, nine, uh, seven rows back, that sort of thing. That was like something that was great to be able to do. Um, if I get those pictures, the one that went for best armor, unfortunately was not one of those. Um, like the other big contender was one for, um, I even did a uh, cosplay of Guts from Berserk in the Dragon Slayer armor, which looked amazing. But the one who won was uh, some armor from Dark Souls, which also looked fantastic. Um, it was really good. 
there are some uh like one of the, also one of the competitors in the cosplay contest uh, well they didn't win in the contest itself they won for hall cosplay which was but um unfortunately i didn't get the picture of their costume from the hall uh because they had, they had some really great bits as a character from dark souls 3 uh something god eater or something like or eater of gods or something like that that was um really fantastic with some nice bits in terms touches of bits in terms of like uh the character has this trail of skulls on the back of this dress that was really exquisitely done uh day three um outside of closing ceremonies um big thing there was uh i got a couple panels um i did oh was the hollywood squares panel so a couple years ago i went and took part in anime jeopardy as a contestant and placed second last year i was paneling and were i was not able to take part but i was able to go to, to celebrity jeopardy and that was interesting this year, um, I wasn't going to do any of the Jeopardy stuff, but I did want to do the trivia game stuff again because I had done um, before this. If you read the blog, you'll see me post about this um, on a Sunday. I had written up a only connect uh, anime trivia game for Desert Bus for Hope, which I submitted to his challenge and for a challenge and was accepted. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do the um, Hollywood Squares thing. Unfortunately for the panelists, two of his other planned panelists had to cancel. They weren't able to make it. So I said, hey, does anyone in the audience want to volunteer? And I did. I did and was accepted and got to be, rather than one of the contestants, I instead got to um, do the acts, do be a um, Hollywood Squares panelist. And that was a very interesting experience because on the one hand, you are being... It's a trivia... You, you are very much a part of the trivia game in terms of you're being asked the questions. You don't know the answer. You give your best answer, asterisk, and then the contestants decide whether they agree or disagree. And that, for, the, for those who are not familiar with, with uh, Hollywood Squares, and that determines whether they get their spot on the bingo board. Uh, as for just being, you can and are encouraged to bluff in Hollywood Squares if you are one of the panelists. And so it was a fun bit of me going, I know what the answer like, like, okay, I don't know what the answer is. I'm going to give my best guess. I think I know what the answer is, but I'm not necessarily going to guess that. I don't know for certain because it's more interesting um, if, say, this person doesn't get it and the game runs on longer, that sort of thing. And then uh, I know the answer, and then I will either give it straight or bluff based on whether I expect, I don't expect, but whether, in my opinion, which has a more interesting outcome uh, as far as for if the um, panelists, if, if the contestant goes with my answer. That was a very fun experience. Yeah, I do hope um, I get a chance to try and do that again. Uh, I will say, having watched um, the Loading Run Crew, and I'll link to the video in question, in the show notes it's also going to be in my uh, favorites um playlist but after watching various takes on only connect over the course of this past year's desert bus for hope i have come to the conclusion that for anime conventions celebrity jeopardy is not actually the most interesting option Celebrity only connect with 
the contestants either being two teams or just one team that gets to collaborate but doing the full set of questions all three rounds is potentially actually more interesting from a viewing standpoint because you have the t is you because you have the contestants on mic trying to figure out what they want their answer to be giving it a degree of a time limit but something more generous than they would get on the actual game show because you're fitting this into a pa into a um, panel space in terms of the, the um on part panel slot I should say so that's a bit of a thought there um and other than that I went to the uh panel about um various japanese events uh anime and video game related events some other stuff i do about before in terms of comic cat and uh wonder festival and tokyo game show and that sort of thing uh, pop-up theme cafes and museums and exhibits and that sort of thing um, but I appreciate like appreciate this panel existed because some body bunch this is stuff that other people would not necessarily know. Like I know about Wonder Festival at all because I read the blogs of Emmett Um But I'm there's probably a lot of people who don't read that blog. And so they don't know about Wonder Festival. They don't know about Japanese model kit and garage kit culture and that sort of thing and how that connects to Wonder Festival and thus in turn why Wonder Festival exists and how there are like limited edition model kits and garage kits that you can only get at Wonderfest. That sort of stuff. So, it's fun to have that panel and have that information getting out there. And then there was, um, other than that, the, the, the um, MVs contest and closing ceremonies. Um, really, some really interesting and fun videos at the AMV contest this year. Um, some stuff that like, the, the best in show winner was doing some things that I had, I'd seen similar, some, some similarly imaginative and inventive and innovative stuff done in AMVs before in terms of completely remixing and re, um, recombining things together to the point where much of the amv was not necessarily the anime stuff and this became something new and unique in its own right so like that in of itself was amazing and fantastic uh, but the other like more traditional amv videos that were alongside it were also great as well uh there were a few things where i'm like i wish i'd been in the audience to uh, gauge the reaction to them when they first originally because like one of the this this year brought the uh, best retro category back for the AMV contest, and one of the videos that won like coordinator's choice, but and which clearly was in their best retro category, was a video with footage from "You're Under Arrest," um, and I would have been interested to see like what the or in here rather what the audience response to that would have been would be now. Because like I am a fan of "You're Under." Arrest. Um, but I'm, I'm my I'm aware that my with my fandom that this is a series that exists because this is the creator of uh, my goddess wanting to indulge both his mechanical aptitude uh, uh, the, the, the affinity for doing mechanical design and his affinity for drawing cute girls and when combine those two together by oh what can I do to concept can i come up with for a series that will let me draw cute girls and have them do car chases um with modern cars um and well you're under arrest you have the you have these two traffic cops basically and we're gonna use this obscure model of a japanese um car that has like a little motor mini motorcycle in the trunk that it's shipped with um that's part of it and that's why that exists but on the other hand like we are now in a world which is very critical of depictions of law enforcement and media and 
I think that you could, that if somebody were to say, oh, you're under arrest is propaganda because it depicts working the traffic bureau as uh, you get to hang out with cute girls um, while you're doing parking and enforcing parking and speeding tickets. Um, and somebody said that that's propaganda. I'm like, yeah, well, I can see that. I'm like, that's the same reason, that, like, police in the pod got somewhat justifiably lambasted in terms of its depiction of the Japanese police, especially in the case of it, like, being like, um, like with early episodes being, oh, the cops get, get too much and unfair criticism. Like, you know, Japanese police probably do get a fair amount of, of fair criticism. Um, particularly regarding how, as we've seen with how like drug laws are handled, and not to put a fine point on it, like how prosecutions are done, where they operate more or less from the perspective of over. If we are sending a case for prosecution, the judicial system will set will assume oh. If a case is being sent up for prosecution, then clearly the person is more likely guilty because of the amount, because um, of in the past what the burden of proof was for prosecution. Thus, a term actually makes it significantly harder for the defense to get an acquittal. If you played Phoenix right, that is in fact a satire of the Japanese criminal justice system so like that is like it's so like if it, if it seems harsh and dystopian it's a harsh and dystopian system that actually exists in the real world in japan and the original game is just set in japan that sort of thing um so that that's nothing to be aware of um so like i would have been interested to see oh when that played was the audience like oh no actually this is actually pretty good i'm like yeah yeah, and maybe people are like, oh, I should check out you're under arrest. Or is this like a bit of grumble, 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 eh, it's this, this stupid cop thing. I mean, the editing's pretty good, but it's kind of eh, that sort of stuff. Um, there was also like even some really good stuff in the didn't get nominated, like was submitted but didn't get nominated category. There was a video for Gensh was using footage from Genshin Impact with HUD removal and that's sort of stuff with a lot of match cuts um, using not just attack animation, but emote and idle animations in interesting ways where like not only was it being expensive in terms of getting all these characters through the gotcha pulls, but also uh, in the sense of um, time intensive work into this for getting these match cuts to work right in terms of the blocking for these shots so that they move right into each other the way you want them to. That takes some, that, like somebody like had to go, okay, I gotta put a lot of work together to figure out how do these animations sag into each other so that when, the, so it, I can make sure that each cut merges into the other appropriately. That was like, so that was, well, look, watching it, a lot of work. There was a similar video that did get nominated and win, which also did a lot of stuff with match cuts and loving motorcycle sequences in film. Um, but that one was working, going more off of type of shot and types of stunts, which, and wasn't necessarily literally match cutting on the same camera angle and that sort of thing which made for a very different thing um read in terms of like it so i think the genshin video did it a bit better but i do appreciate both videos they're trying to do very similar uh, they're in different things in a similar way um and that covers like most of the of the Stuff for more kind of been talking for about an, almost an hour or so. Um, I will. I took a bunch of uh, Hall cosplay photos, a 
double up on a couple of them just like um, because I've I've been taught to take two pictures of anything when I photography training or learning to do photography when I was younger because there's always the possibility that some of the, one of the shots didn't turn out in a couple of cases a couple of the shots didn't turn out so you know all worked out pretty so it worked out okay um I put together image galleries on uh Google Photo, I will all and all they will also be going up on my blog. Um, so I will put a link to those in the show notes. Um, I do encourage you to um if you went to Moracon and you have your own uh cosplay photo galleries that you would like to share, please, please link to them below as well. I'd love to see what costumes I missed. Over 10,000 people came to the convention this year. So there is a very strong possibility that there are some awesome costumes that I didn't get to see. I know for a fact that in my social media feeds on Blue Sky and on Mastodon, I saw people posting pictures of like being dressed up as Free Planets Alliance people from Legend of Galactic Heroes. Um, and me not having run into those people at the convention. So they were there. I just wasn't in the places where they were at. Um, and so I didn't get a chance to take pictures of them. Uh, on the other hand, like I managed to run into a person who was dressed up as Gideon the Ninth. So, hey, I got to take a picture again. A couple pictures of that. So and some people probably missed that. So, hey, that's, that's something to look forward to. So please feel free to post links to your uh, Kamoracon photo gallery as well in the comments. I would love to see them, and I'm certain other viewers would love to see them as well. Uh, and also, I hope to see some of you at Kamoracon next year. Thank you all very much for watching. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.